Hey guys, so I'm gonna get started now. Um, welcome to the CASA Aid USA Talks About webinar series. My name is Amna. I'm the co-lead for the New Jer uh, CASA Aid New Jersey chapter. And in this webinar, we're going to be talking about uh, domestic violence awareness during the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment and mention the uh, trigger warning. We're gonna be mentioning, um, discussing a lot of sensitive topics and themes during the discussion tonight. So if you are triggered, um, you can men private mention me, uh, private message me and what I'll do is during the end of the session, I'll connect you with one of our panelists at, in a break, uh, breakout room and they'll be able to further assist you. Or what you can do is um, text love is to uh, 1-866-331-9497. Or you could go to the website, thehotline.org. Um, what we recommend is using the <clears throat> safest option, po uh, op option possible for yourself. Um, if you'd like to take a, a screenshot of this uh, screen, you can do that. Or um, in the text box, you'll see that um, Monbri will be posting the same information for you as well. So I'll give you a second to take a screenshot of that. Okay, so um, <clears throat> um, before getting started, I just want to take a moment to discuss what CASA Aid is and what it's about. So CASA Aid is a nonprofit humanitarian organization which was founded in 1999 and it supports victims of natural or man-made disasters internationally for over 20 years. We have worked on many humanitarian projects successfully all over the world. CASA Aid is founded on the fundamentals of the Sikh religion, the core of which is service to humanity and the prosperity of all. CASA Aid USA for the past uh, last two years has been focused on supporting underserved local communities such as veterans, homeless families, including the empowerment of survivors of domestic violence. Domestic violence, unfortunately, is a hidden threat in all of our communities. During the current COVID-19 pandemic and the subsequent lockdowns, we've seen an increase in the reporting of the domestic violence cases. Domestic violence is a term that automatically triggers most of us to think of physical violence. However, many of the facets of domestic violence are not physical. And the aim, of the, the aim here tonight is to raise awareness of the non-physical aspects of the abuse. And that's what we'd like to focus on tonight. Now I'd like each of the panelists to introduce themselves. We'll start with um, Margaret Abrams from Women Rising. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Margaret Abrams, and I am the Domestic Violence Response Team Coordinator of Hudson County for Women Rising. Women Rising assists women and their families to achieve self-sufficiency and live safe, fulfilling, and productive lives through social services, economic development, and advocacy services. Um, I am at also a nationally credentialed advanced domestic violence intervention specialist. I am also a community educator, support group facility, and a cut it out trainer. I've been in the field for over 18 years now, and I've been providing services to women rising clients and the Hudson County community for um, over 15 years. And I just have to say, it's an absolute honor to be a panelist today. And thank you so much for allowing um, us to bring domestic violence to the forefront because in doing so we're saving lives and creating healthy families and that creates healthy communities. So thank you. 
Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, Stephanie? Hi, I am Stephanie Klotz. Um, I'm the professional training manager at JBWS, which is the domestic violence agency for Morris County, New Jersey. We offer a full range of services for everyone, individual and family members that are impacted by abuse, regardless of race, gender, or the type of experience that they abuse. And I wanna echo Margaret's sentiments that I'm really excited to be here to help <clears throat> spread awareness about the issue and keep the community informed. Thank you, Stephanie. Azadi? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Azadi, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm a youth counselor, youth mental health counselor and advocate at SACI um, for South Asian Women, which is an organization that is based, it's a nonprofit that's based out of New York City. Um, we have an office in Queens and in Manhattan. Um, and what we do is serve South Asian survivors of gender-based violence, regardless again of their gender, also um, racial background, ethnic background, country of origin. Um, but we do specialize in um, services that are catered to folks who might not speak English and might speak South Asian languages or other um, cultural, have other cultural needs that come up in um, as part of their um, journey towards seeking the end to their gender-based violence that they might be experiencing. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your introductions. You'll ha you all have a wealth of experience and expertise in this area. And I'd like to start the discussion for today. Um, domestic abuse is a continuing threat in all of our communities. Uh, could you please discuss why a panel in domestic violence awareness is even more relevant this year? Um, I'd like to start with Stephanie. I think, um, you know, this year we've all been so isolated and that is one of the main issues that survivors are facing as they're navigating an abusive home. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's really important that we take advantage of reaching people virtually. And then I think a panel is great because bringing different perspectives together is always important. Everyone has a different lens um, that they see things through. So I always love the opportunity to hear multiple voices about the same issue. Thank you. Um, Margaret, uh, would you like to add? Uh, yes, it's only through opportunities such as this that uh, we could actually take part in educating others on abusive relationships and how to help someone they may love or know and inform those in need of the services that are available. It's even more important at this time because of the new control tactics that abusers have developed, the increased isolation, minimal contact with support systems, limited access to services, and higher levels of stress, fear, and depression, which we all know cause abuse to escalate. Thank you, and Zadi? Yeah, I'll echo um, what the other panelists have said, you know, in times of crisis, violence against any historically marginalized and oppressed group increases. And we see this in times of natural disasters as well of, as, well as man-made crises all around the world, insecurity and uncertainty, whether it has to do with food or employment, housing or any other need always leads to higher rates of all forms of violence. Um, this is the case also with gender-based violence. And I think it's important to raise awareness around gender-based violence and domestic violence um, because we're still learning so much about what that means and how it shows up in different communities, how it shows up in different um, moments like this one. Um, and because COVID is so related to higher rates of unemployment, housing, um, and food insecurity, um, it, it's, it's all the, the more important that we um, address the sort of minute um, ways in which the, the sort of specific ways in which COVID is being used as, as a tactic of control. I, I wholeheartedly agree um, with that. Thank you. Um, for the next uh, discussion, I would like to discuss the, um, the general perception of domestic abuse centers around uh, physical abuse, but 
abuse is not always physical. Based on your organization's outreach, could you uh, speak to some of the other aspects of abuse? Um, Margaret? Well, clients come to us physically, emotionally, sexually, and or economically abused, just to name a few scenarios. But I think what I want to bring attention to is the digital abuse, because many people don't look at digital abuse as, as though that could be, um, you know, endangering others' lives. But with digital abuse, we know is the behavior of using the technologies and or social media networking to intimidate, harass, threaten, you know, the current or ex-partner, family member, roommate, um, whatever. Um, and some of the tactics that are used are, you know, something as simple as, but not, I'm not minimizing it, demanding passwords, checking cell phones, cyberbullying, non-consensual sexting, excessive or threatening text, stalking on social media. And one of the most dangerous is GPS tracking. And many people don't realize that, you know, GPS tracking is taking place on your phone in all social media. If you, you know, take a picture and post it on certain website, uh, so certain social media platforms, um, some of them actually come up with the location that you're currently at. So imagine if you're a victim survivor of domestic violence and here you are just maybe casually, you know, crossing the street and somebody's there taking a picture and then that picture is, you know, put out there on social media, that abuser may see you in the background. And we have actually experienced that with one of our clients where their location was found due to a video that was posted um, live, actually it went live and they were, they were found out, their location was disclosed and they didn't even give consent to be in that video. So one thing that I, I would like really to get out with the digital abuse is truly be mindful of posting pictures, people that are going to be in the picture, making sure that you're getting that consent from them to post it, um, and really shutting down whatever it is that may give access to your location, if you are a victim survivor, um, if you're a family friend, um, or even just a community member, you know, be mindful of the people that are around you and, and you know, make sure that you get consent. Thank you, that was very insightful. Um, Stephanie? Um, absolutely. I definitely want to echo Margaret's sentiments about technology abuse and add that it might often just start off with like, especially with the younger people really cute, like, oh, let's share our location so that we, you know, can make sure we're safe. Um, so to really watch out for something like that, even just early on in the relationship. Um, I also want to highlight emotional abuse. This is one that when I was seeing clients, they always talk about as really having more of an impact for them than the physical. A lot of my clients, I worked in a longer term facility and it would be years later and they'd say, you know what, it's the words that this person said to me are still the words I'm using to beat myself up when I make a mistake. And it's so much harder to shake. And it's also so much harder to identify, right? If someone hits me, and they leave a mark, I can look in the mirror and see visually that someone's done something wrong to me. But if they chip away at my self-esteem, when I look in the mirror, I just see whatever picture they've painted, right? And it's much harder to identify. I also, um, I love, there's an article that was posted in a Huff Post maybe five years ago called, He Never Hit Me. And it really highlights that emotional and psychological abuse. And I think it can be hard for survivors to say this is abuse because we think it has to be violent, because we think that there is always that physical component. And it's like, oh, well, it's not that, right? But there's so many other things that go into the abuse that build those barricades around people and keep them from being able to get free. Um, beyond that, that physical abuse. Could you give an example of um, a type of comment 
could that could be sure. perceived as you know, I think that there's a lot of different ways. It could be as much as, you know, riding on the coattails of of my own negative self-talk. So if I mess something up and I'm like, oh, like I burned that thing, you know, and my friend would be like, whatever, you know, you'll like do it great next time, or it's not that big of a deal. My abusive partner might be like, Yeah, you can't get anything right. Right. And so just kind of like you're not expecting that, right? You're not going to notice it because you're already maybe in that space of like beating yourself up. Um, or it could be something like, oh, I'm so glad you changed your pants. You looked fat in the other ones. And it's like, wait, is, like, I don't like that comment, but like, what is that? Right. And so it's, it can be kind of covert. Um, and like, you're not, you might not even really notice it happening kind of like that. Thank you. Yeah. I would love to piggyback on what Stephanie just said about um, uh, emotional and psychological abuse, um, like especially over a prolonged period of time can just build up, right? And I think what it goes back to, again, with the definitions of abuse, you know, we're expanding our understandings as a, as a culture about what abuse means. I think um, there have been cases in the Supreme Court over the past few years, right, or in the media of, um, sexual harassment, of threats, of sexual violence, and we see them being dismissed, right? That is a systemic form of, of like of gender-based violence, right? Of, of violence that is, it goes unrecognized and untalked about. And that too can contribute to um, psychological trauma and abuse in general, because we have a culture that doesn't want to acknowledge um, that type of violence. Um, but then to add on more specifically what this might look like in an intimate partner way, something that we see a lot at Seki um, is threats of violence to oneself, right? So a partner might say, might emotionally manipulate someone by saying like, if you leave right now, I will kill myself, right? Um, mm -hmm. Is it, sorry, I should have put a trigger warning on that. Um, but suicidal ideation or homicidal ideation, threats of, threats of violence, um, even just threats of um, emotional threats, like I won't love you if you won't if you don't do this for me, that's also very common. Um, or you know, even just something a little bit more subtle might be like, what will people say, right? Lo kya kenge about what you just did. I mean, you're bringing shame to the family, things like that. So shaming, guilt. Um, uh, threats, emotional threats like that, um, of th threats of harm, even if the physical harm never happens, can be such a major contributing factor to, is a major way in which um, people have found to control other people's actions. Um, and I think it's also a thing that's important to highlight because that can happen between any um, two family members, right? It can happen between um, a husband and a wife. It can happen from any person of any gender to another person of any gender. Um, it can happen between age groups. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that that's um, a very overlooked um, form of abuse. And in addition to that, I think spiritual abuse is also really quote coded um, and something mm -hmm. that we see coming up in you know, a culturally specific way. Um, where spiritual texts are used to put down or shame another person. Um, you know, there might be misinformation or a text is interpreted in a particular, particular way and there isn't an allowance for that text to be interpreted in any other way. Um, and so using, yeah, using, you know, even an entire, um, some, an entire community to hold you to do something in a, in a more intimate setting. Um, and then I would say the other ones that are, I think, often overlooked are forms of neglect is really highly overlooked um, because it's, again, so difficult to identify, right? So maybe you're, um, maybe you're not providing as much if you have the resources, like let's say someone does have the resources, but they are purposefully not providing those resources as a form of punishment to a young person, to an elder, to anyone in that, that they have, uh, you know, could provide support to um, is definitely a form of, of um, gender-based violence that gets neglected. Also stalking and harassment, um, you know, whether it's digital or real, uh, or I mean, not real, but sort of digital or not digital analog, um, where 
you know, this forms of stalking, it, it, there's a subtle line between between just looking at someone's Facebook all the time and leaving comments all the time, right? Incessantly or being told like, please don't leave comments and then continuing to leave those comments, um, messaging and um, yeah, showing up around, just happening to be in the same place as someone um, consistently, repeatedly um, creates this, this, this fear that has long lasting impacts and um, is a major contributor to PTSD, you know, symptoms of PTSD. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so the next question would be, uh, what changes, if any, have you noticed in the cases that you have encountered in your organizations during the pandemic? Um, Stephanie? We've seen quite a bit of change um, with our crisis response team, our volunteers that are meeting with people down at the police station and getting them information right after an incident happens. That um, the manager in that program is reporting seeing a lot more mental health related cases. And that makes sense, right? When you think about what's going on during COVID, all of our mental health is not the best it could be right now. And we're all, I think, struggling. Um, no one's their best self. And so I think that makes sense. Certainly I wanna be really clear that you don't have to have a mental health issue in order to be abused or abusive to your partner. I also wanna be really clear that just because you're abused by a partner doesn't mean you're going to have a mental health issue. Um, those are some, some kind of common misconceptions. That being said, if you are someone that struggles with mental health issues and you're navigating an abusive relationship or you're someone that abuses your partner, that is going to make it more dangerous, right? And it's gonna escalate the situation and um, really kind of turn the volume up. We've also seen with that, um, I really especially wanna highlight PTSD, right? Even for survivors that are have left the relationship, some of the issues that we're navigating are similar to that, right? We're really under a lot of control. And so for, for people that are still just kind of navigating that aftermath, there's been a lot of trigger of that PTSD as well. Thank you. Uh, Margaret? Well, during the pandemic, um, I've heard of new tactics being used by abusers that I would have never imagined and have never heard of in, you know, from past clients. Clients have been told that the police departments were shut down. So there was nobody to come and help them if they called, um, withholding sanitizing items from them, um, increased food insecurities, threatening to give them COVID. Um, Oh, if there was co-parenting that was taking place with an ex-partner um, when they uh, had the children with them, they had stated they wouldn't return them out of fear of um, the other parent, the, the one that, you know, is the survivor in it. The other parent was continuing to work and, you know, the, they felt as though the children were at risk of, uh, you know, con contracting uh, COVID due to their jobs. So it, it was just an increasing amount of new tactics that we heard of that we never ever imagined would ever take place. You know, it, it's kind of like just when you, you think you've heard everything and there's, there's not one situation that you haven't heard, then something like this comes into play and you say, wow, we would have never thought that would be used as an, a tactic, hand sanitizer, bleach, you know, uh, we would have never thought that would have come into play, but, but it has during the pandemic. Right. Thank you. Uh, Azadi? Yeah, um, I'm, you know, I was, we were talking about the importance of having this panel and I'm, <laughs> I'm absorbing it even as, as we're having it because it's wild, you know, listening to Margaret talk about um, the use of COVID as a, 
as a tool of control. And it is so to hear that it's happening in other places, right? That the, there are trends in the ways in which people um, abuse and the ways and people try to try to maintain power in their relationships. Um, so we've definitely seen that, um, you know, the use of COVID as a tool of control, um, threatening to infect, you know, folks threatening to infect immune compromised folks based by saying like, oh, I'm going to bring this home to you. Um, misinformation about the virus, right? Everything from it being unreal, saying that it doesn't exist, to restricting access to life outside of the home um, mm -hmm. because of COVID. I mean, to an extreme degree, restricting access to life outside of the home. Um, or like, ex you know, and, and in, in relation to that sort of res um, exaggerating, you know, in the ways in which you can get COVID, um, ignoring that the, the sort of medical guidelines around that. Um, and then using shame, right? Saying that, again, saying that the person could bring, uh, that someone could bring COVID home if they leave or blaming someone for COVID infections or other types of infections mm -hmm. that someone might be carrying. Like, oh, I'm feeling sick now. Like, this is all your fault. Um, or also we've seen abuse between landlords and some of our survivors. So landlords using COVID as an excuse um, to threaten eviction. Um, and say, you know, making all kinds of totally illegal threats, right? And a completely um, not based in any kind of actual power that the, that landlord may have, but creating a, a, a sort of atmosphere of fear so that this person f leaves of their own, own quote unquote, own volition. But of course it's not. Um, and then also controlling custody, um, especially since now everything is slowed down in the courts. Um, it's harder to be able to address a violation of custody. Related to that, core, all court proceedings that have slowed down, slowed down have affected, um, like, you know, it's really, it's much harder and a slower process to, to apply for divorce. Um, and then let's say that your spouse is not paying support, like not giving you spousal support or child support, that's also um, hard to bring up because the court system is so slowed down by COVID. We actually saw initially um, an initial 50% drop in the calls that we were receiving, which was alarming. Um, and to us was an indicator that there was so much less privacy and agency available um, because of the lockdown restrictions, right? To, to our clients to be able to call us, to be able to access us. Um, we've also seen a 1,455% increase in um, requests for financial assistance because of the high rates of unemployment and um, increased housing and rental assistant needs. And the number of new clients now at this point in the pandemic um, grows exponentially every week. Um, from July, one statistic I have is that from July, 2019 to July, 2020, there was a hundred percent increase in the number wow. of new clients. Um, we also are seeing more young people reach out um, so, you know, I don't know if everyone has context for this, but um, recently in New York City, we saw a specifically South Asian Me Too movement, a Daishi Me Too movement emerge where many young survivors came forward with their stories of the, the abuse that they had faced it from, from somewhat like, you know, um, definitely respected local leaders, um, you know, and in public places and in places of trust, like doctor's offices or after school programs. Um, and so with along with that Daishi Me Too movement also, we were able to then open up a text line. Um, so we're seeing more people reach out, young people especially reach out through our text line and through Instagram and other social media sharing their stories. But that's also, you know, it's a snowball effect. Um, so there's so much, COVID has changed so much. Um, mm -hmm but also exposed so much that was already there. Thank you. So um, in the news and the media, more often male and female intimate partner violence is reported. And to add on to that, does it always have to be an intimate relationship? Um, Margaret? No, the relationship, it can be 
marriage, dating, living together, um, separated, heterosexual, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, could be a family member, it could be a roommate. So there's, you know, it's, it's a wide variety of people. I mean, there has to be some type of relationship. I mean, even if you're dating and, um, you know, your, your teenagers, you know, if there's a child in common, or if there's a pregnancy, then you have your own rights um, within the state of New Jersey to file um, charges and file for protection orders. But in all reality, I mean, domestic violence, there's, you know, there are no prejudices, you know, um, it affects any age, sex, race, religion, culture, educational, social, you know, uh, occupational background, there is no, um, you know, nobody is immune to domestic violence, you know, it's, it, it impacts anyone, you know, it's, it's not just one, you know, given person or one type of relationship, you know, I mean, it could be children against their parents, you know, caregivers, um, you know, it's anyone. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie? Yeah, I think this is one of the most common misconceptions about domestic violence. It's because that's really how the movement started was um, with Battered Women. My agency changed just their name recently from Jersey Battered Women's Services to be just JBWS, really with the idea that we don't want anyone that doesn't identify as a battered woman to feel like they can't be included in our services, right? It can, it's this dynamic, right? Where one person is using these tactics to have power and control over another person. And it's, you know, it is across any relationship because these are the tactics that work, right? And in our society, we're taught that people should have power and control over each other, right? And that that's something to be sought after. And so if that's something that you are seeking and these are the tactics that work, <clears throat> then in any relationship where you're seeking that, these are the tactics that you're gonna use. And so my agency and all agencies really identify that it's this dynamic that's the issue, um, not, um, not really who is the person that's using abuse and who's the person that's being abused. And I also want to mention one of the statistics that I find most interesting is that, um, you know, people that are abusive to their partners don't have to grow up in a home where there was abuse, right? And that, I think a lot of the time we think that everyone that uses these tactics grew up in a home where they witnessed it. And that's not the case. You can learn it from society. You can learn it from your friends. And that's because we're taught that you should have power and control. And these are the tactics that you use in order to get that. And they work that it really is just about any relationship, right? You, you see it in bullying with friends, right? It's the same tactics. It's the same dynamics um, that that's the issue, right? It's that, that dynamic of one person being abusive to get that power and control. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, Stephanie, thanks for saying that because um, so because I work with youth, I do a lot of like psychoeducation around what abuse looks like. And one of the things I've been doing is looking at moments in culture, pop culture, where we see abusive dynamics and relationship dynamics being held up. Right. Just like reality television and songs in and, and Bollywood movies. It's all over the place. It's all over the place. And it's so normalized. And actually, you know, healthy relationships. It's a, what is that? Like a lot of my young people are like, I don't know what that means. Like, I just want a relationship, you know, like what is, you know, what do you mean a healthy relationship? Um, and I, it's, it's an interesting question because there aren't, there aren't that many like easy references to point to. And you, and I really have to like sift through material to find them. Um, they do exist. <laughs> um, and I think also just like calling from, you know, asking, I, I often ask my youth, like what, what they, um, how they want to be treated by other people. And, and I'm, the basic guideline is like, that's, yeah, like, you know, explore treating another person the same way you want to be treated. It's a, it's a more nuanced, bigger conversation. But um, yeah, just to echo um, what our other panelists have said, yeah, definitely anyone can cause harm to anyone else, including people who have been harmed, right? I think that's something that we don't often 
talk about, we, we can sometimes take agency away from, from folks who have experienced harm. And, um, you know, I think historically we've talked about um, victims of sexual assault and, and it's like the, the typical image you get is of a very um, sort of like a femme presenting, a feminine presenting person with, with a physical abuse, like visible on their face. Um, when it's actually, there's like a whole range of different types of abuse that we've covered here that, you know, wouldn't be, wouldn't, that picture wouldn't represent. Um, and I think in particular, something that I do want to highlight is that um, in-laws, right? Like, I think that's a huge part of South Asian culture um, where, um, and I think it can be in, in, in other cultures too, but that's, this is where I have experienced it is um, seeing courts not be able to recognize, you know, in the process of getting an order of protection that actually, you know, an, a, the abuser might be a sister-in-law, it might be a mother-in-law, it might be even a, a sister, a sibling, you know, it might be someone um, that the traditional uh, picture of domestic violence doesn't capture. Um, so yeah, I, I just anyone, anywhere can do it to anyone. Thank you. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna cut down the uh, discussion points to two more. So um, how do I or any of the viewers recognize the signs of domestic violence in our families, friendships, or relationships? especially where the relationships may not be intimate in nature. And just to chime in, um, how do I help or help the person experiencing the DV situation? Um, Stephanie? This is such an important question. And I think, um, you know, really, you can see if someone is fearful of their partner, if they are, you know, if someone, if their partner cuts them down emotionally in front of you, if it's something that you you wouldn't want your partner to say to you, or you're like, I don't like that you said that about my friend or my loved one. Um, if it, if it doesn't feel right, that's a red flag, right? And so um, if you notice that that they are, you know, not able to come out anymore because they have to check with their partner. Um, and I think right now with COVID, that can be a great way to kind of suss out some of this because we're all navigating COVID and, and Margaret named some really unique ways that people are using COVID as, as an excuse for an abuse as an, and as a new tactic. And so if you're able to engage people in conversation of, you know, what's it like? And they're like, oh, well, you know, my partner needs the wipes because their job this, right? So I don't really have access to them. The kids and I have to just try to wash our hands when we can, or, or that we don't get the sanitizer, right? And if you see some of those things, right, that you see this imbalance and, um, you know, I'm really scared. Um, you know, my partner said, I can't see you because they're scared that I'm going to bring home COVID, even though their partner's out all around town doing whatever, it doesn't have to make sense, right? But you can notice that there are imbalances in that relationship, right? Or a fear dynamic or this dynamic of, I can't make a decision without this person. And not just, I need to talk to my partner about like making sure we don't you know, they're not golfing that day when we have a child together, right? Someone has to watch the child. Um, I'm not talking about that kind of decision-making, but if someone is never able to be the person that goes out and sees their friends or, you know, navigate that, um, that can all be a red flag. And, you know, how you can help, I think, is to just be someone that, that cares, right, and listens and to say, you know, I think that that idea of a comment, I think this happens a lot, right? Where you're like, I don't like the comment that that person just said to my friend or my loved one, but what do I do? And to use that specific and say, you know, I heard so-and-so make this comment about you and I just want you to know, I think you're great. You know, I don't think that you deserve to be spoken to like that. And, um, you know, I just want you to know that I, that I didn't like it. And I think you deserve a partner that, that thinks you're as great as you actually are, right? And if they don't wanna talk about it, to not judge, right? To respect that if it's my story to tell, it's my story to tell. And maybe I haven't said it out loud to anybody. So if you ask me about it, 
even if I have a black eye and I'm not ready to talk about it, to respect that. I think to just maintain a non-judgmental, compassionate stance mm -hmm. of I'll be here if you ever wanna talk to me, right? I care about you. Um, I think you deserve better than that, right? Um, but like, it's your decision, right? And I'm, I'm not gonna push you in one way or the other. I think that that drives more of a wedge and builds more isolation. So to just be consistent and non-judgmental, no matter what someone's going through, um, to have some compassion for what they might be navigating um, and just be consistent in that support. Thank you. Um, Azadi, did you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, sure. I echo the fear um, thing, I mean, about how to notice it in other people and, and relationships. Um, definitely if there's relation, if there's a dynamic of fear, fear of retribution, fear of physical harm, fear of any emotional threats, or even just, you know, just general fear in the relationship that's needs to be addressed or talked about. Um, also cycles, um, uh, you know, abusive relationships can really, can often um, be cyclical in that there are moments of euphoria and really intense love for one another. And then also um, right after that, you know, like moments of just like really hard, intense, deep sorrow and, and sadness and, and, and fear and manipulation and abuse. Um, because I think the mis sometimes people make the mistake of, of thinking, oh, well, like sometimes they're bad and when they're bad, they're really bad or when they're good and when they're good, they're really good, you know? So like looking at the bright side of things and ignoring the negative aspect, um, yeah, it can just like lead to this cycle. And what we know is that um, that cycle of like dopamine and then lack of dopamine, right, is, is actually um, similar to cycles of like, of intoxication or addiction. Um, so that can actually make it harder for someone who's, ex who's going through these cycles to be able to step out of that um, and to undo the, that, that ex the, the repetition of that experience or even to be able to see it. Um, so I think, you know, notice that. And then when you do notice these things, I, I agree with Stephanie, like avoid should language, right? You should do this or you should do that. Um, because telling them what they should or shouldn't do can be re-triggering, disheartening, um, and is only like another person telling them what they should do. Um, instead, I would encourage people to share their concerns by naming observations, right? Concrete observations. I saw this thing happen. And then attaching um, a feeling to that. Like what, what about, what, how did that observation, how did what you observed make you feel? And then asking the person open-ended questions about how they're feeling, right? Give them the space to speak. Be okay with long silences because maybe this is the first time that anyone's asked them. Maybe they're not often encouraged to speak up. Um, and maybe, you know, there's like a whole slew of things. So, so patience, I think, is really important. Affirm their feelings. And then respect that person's right to self-determination de over everything else. Don't force them to do anything that they don't want to do because that only takes their agency away yet again. Thank you, and Margaret? Um, some of the signs would be uh, low self-esteem, maybe overly apologetic for things, um, changes in sleeping or eating patterns anxious or on edge, like if a phone call comes in and the, you know, it may be the abuser getting to the phone on time, responding to the text message as, you know, quickly as possible. There may be substance abuse. Um, you know, they may never have used a, a substance in the past, but being in this relationship, they are now self-medicating. Um, really becoming withdrawn, maybe canceling appointments, you know, doctor's appointments or meetings at the last minute, maybe being, you know, late often, um, excessive privacy, you know, keeping their home life completely private. And, you know, most important the is, you know, um, during pandemic, 
you know, we wouldn't see this difference because we were isolated ourselves, but really isolating themselves from family, friends, from extracurricular activities that they may have enjoyed in the past. And we know that, you know, higher levels of stress and fear and depression, which many of us, um, you know, living in healthy environments may have felt during the pandemic, but now add that layer to an abusive relationship and that causes the abuse to escalate, resulting in like, you know, greater levels of danger for that victim survivor. So I would say, you know, in order to help someone, you need to start that conversation. You need for people, um, you know, victim survivors to to have someone that they feel comfortable to go to. And if it, even if you say, hey, you know, I sat on and was listening to this panel discussion and this is what they talked about and, you know, just starting the conversation, just saying, you know, you are aware and, um, you know, this is the information, listening to them and believing them is so important, you know, because the abuser may be this very well-known person in the community and everybody, you know, adores the person and thinks this person is so great, but what happens behind closed doors is, is something completely different. So really listening to them and believing them, supporting them, educating them on the resources that are available because with allowing them to be able to make their own decisions, which they may be doing that for the very first time, it empowers them. And that's the ultimate goal is that we want to empower them, validate their feelings. Sometimes they're going to be angry, sad. They may be extremely upset that this relationship um, may be coming to an end where everybody else is ecstatic over it. But but they're not, you know, because they, they truly may still love this person. Um, respect every decision. Not to say, as, you know, piggybacking off of the other panelists, is, you know, not to tell them what they should be doing, what we think is best for them, but allowing them to make that decision on their own. Um, because they're, again, we're just doing what the abuser is doing if we're saying you need to do A, B, and C. Um, safety planning with them, really helping them to develop safety plans and always keep the communication available. You know, not to shut that door on them and say, listen, you keep returning back. We know statistically that uh, victim survivors will continuously return back seven to 11 times. Um, you know, really keep the communication available so they know they continuously have someone. Once you shut that door, you're then confirming everything that that abuser was saying by, by them stating, nobody else is going to be there for you like I'm going to be there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, recognizing flashbacks and panic attacks, be attentive to those triggers and recognize the importance of knowing your own self-care. The person that is being emotionally supportive and being that support system for that victim survivor, really knowing your own limits because it is trying at times um, these are people that we care about and we're concerned about letting them know that, but really seeking the self-care that you need. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you brought up uh, excellent points, believing them, validating them, those should statements being avoided. I really appreciate all your viewpoints. And um, because we are running out of time today, I just really wanted to get to some, open up the floor for some Q and A's, if that's okay. Um, please private message me right now um, if you have any questions. Um, so we can ask a couple of questions and get some responses. Let me know. Give me a second, guys. The one question that has come in is, is um, do men really suffer from domestic violence? If anybody would like to take that question, because men are stronger, so is it really a, an issue? Yeah, I can talk about that. Um, 
so I think that that's a it's a huge generalization, right? About um, who men are and what they look like. Like, there's a lot of questions that you know. It's like things vary so much um, depending on one's age, depending on one's background. Finan- like as we mentioned, not all abuse is physical either. So it's not always about how physically strong someone is. Um, so I would you know venture to ask like there are lots of different. There are lots of different types of abuse. There are lots of different types of men. You know, there's trans men, there's um, young boys. Are we calling them men? You know, like seven-year-old, eight-year-old, young, young children, um, 17-year-olds, you know, elderly people um, in their 80s and their 90s. Um, so it, to, if you take this whole group of people, you know, and to make a generalized statement about um, that pop- part of the population is, is not only unfair, it's, it's inaccurate. Um, and so I'll say, I actually do have some statistics, um, you know, a CDC um, study that found that one in 71 men had been um, raped or suffered an attempt within their lifetime. Um, the same study found that approximately one in 21 or 4.8% of men in a survey had been made to penetrate someone else, usually an intimate partner or acquaintance. And um, a study done by the National Violence Against Women survey found that 0.1% of men um, surveyed had had been raped in the previous 12 months compared to 0.3% of women. And um, yeah, it's just, I have have plenty more. I'll say one um, that's also about queer, um, you know, addresses queer men. 30% of gay and bisexual men reported having experienced at least one form of sexual assault during their lifetimes. So, and I, and I want to add, you know, these are some statistics that we do have, but because of this kind of stigma, right, around um, like um, a man seeming weak or something or not a man or man enough because he might have experienced or they might have experienced um, violence, um, there's this, this stigma that prevents um, men from coming forward with their stories of, of assault or, or, or abuse, um, which can contribute to underreporting. Great, thank you. Um, another one that we have is, um, is domestic violence a prim- primarily a straight or heterosexual is- issue? Isn't it easier for same-sex couples to leave a relationship? I can answer this one. Um, And I think it really piggybacks off what Azadi just said, that um, really it's not about who you are or physically, who's physically stronger. It really is um, just about this dynamic and about one person having power and control over the other. And I think I wanna add that some, there's not a lot of funding for this issue, unfortunately, and there's even less funding for the LGBTQ plus community. And so with that, you have very limited research, but what we do know with that limited research is that we see the incidents at least just as high, if not higher for the LGBTQ community. And that makes sense, right? If you're thinking about that that group is oppressed in our population, they're marginalized, then that is going to be used against them within their abusive relationship. Um, and so <clears throat> it's not harder to leave, you know, if you're a young trans woman and you are looking to go to a shelter, there was a point in time where a shelter might ask you if you'd had an operation yet, right? If you were still physically, right, on paper, or whatever they would want to say, a, a man, right? And so things are changing. This has been a, a slow evolution, but for people to feel safe, feel welcome, and know that services are available is an additional barrier um, beyond the marginalizations that they're facing in the community. So I would say absolutely not easier, and then also um, at least occurring at least as frequently, if not more frequently, for this community. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I just wanted to say that, you, you know, due to the interest of time, we weren't able to get through all the uh, discussion points. However, thank you so much um, to all the panelists here today. Um, it was truly an honor to hear all your viewpoints. And as mentioned throughout 
this webinar, uh, domestic violence reporting has increased throughout the start of the pandemic. And it is crucial that we all understand the severity of this issue. Um, thank you, Azadi, Margaret, and Stephanie for taking out the time from your busy schedules to be here today. It was very insightful and I'm, I'm sure that all the viewers enjoyed it as well. And I also wanna take the time to thank Manpreet, uh, Vrinder, Aman, Jasneek, and Amrit from the CASA A team for making this event possible. And of course, for all the viewers for taking the time to join the event today. And if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to email the CASA aid um, email, which I will be posting. Um, Amanbri, do you mind uh, sending it out in the group chat for me, please? The CASA aid New Jersey t uh, email. And um, thank you guys for joining. Um, have a good.